Okay, can everyone hear me all right? Yes, no? Cool. All right, I'm going to get started. Um, this is Layout Design Patterns, and my name is John Ferris. You can find me on Twitter at pixel underscore whip. Um, I work for at Design Group, a design strategy and development shop in Denver, Colorado. And we do a lot of work with organizations doing good work around the world. And a lot of these organizations are fairly large. They have a lot of content. Um, a lot of them are sharing reports and data. They have different agencies around the world. And so the sites that we typically work on are fairly complex, rich in content, like reports with related graphs. Uh, we do a lot of mapping, um, a lot of stuff like that. And our sites, all the sites we work on are responsive. And so with a lot of content and doing responsive design, we end up with usually some pretty complex layout challenges, a lot of problems to solve. So I spent a lot of my day trying to figure out how to get, you know, content in the right place on the page so it's still readable and usable. Um, so it's a lot of thinking time about how things are going to rearrange and whatnot. Um, and as I'm solving these different problems day to day, I find myself, you know, attacking the same problem. Um, over and over. Uh, just to give you an example. This is a site we worked on for Colorado Public Radio. Um, it, I guess in its simplest form, there's, I guess, what you could call a sidebar um, along the right hand side and then main content. Um, but really, when you look at this, it's just, you know, it's just two columns of content. Um, and Again, when we look at the, some smaller pieces, uh, we have this kind of marquee at the top that has navigation that changes the story. That's two columns. We have the latest news and a featured news story, um, two columns again. And these problems are typically recursive, so we have within that navigation, there's two columns. Uh, along the right-hand rail, we have uh, it's called an on-air block. It shows, like, whatever's currently playing on one of their three different uh, radio stations. And they have whoever the host is at the time, what song they're playing, or what, what show they're hosting. Again, two columns. So it's the same problem over and over, um, which is in itself a design pattern. <coughs> and all a design pattern is is common solutions to reoccurring problems within a given context. Um, the, the idea itself didn't come from computer science or graphic design. It actually came from architecture. Um, an architect and professor at Berkeley University named Christopher Alexander um, in the 70s came up with this theory that um, a lot of the great places in the world, places that you know you feel alive in, that you want to live in, you want to be in, that those places weren't necessarily designed by architects. They were probably designed by you know, a farmer who built his barn or built his house. Um, not a classically trained architect. He just built it out of these reusable patterns um, kind of like rules of thumb. And so in 1979, he published this um, book, The Timeless Way of Building, that described this theory. And if you ever get your hands on one of these books, they're, I think they're pretty fascinating reads. Um, the Timeless Way of Building describes this theory itself, and the pattern language is kind of a, a complementary to that, in which it describes actual like individual patterns for solving these problems, like... Start, it starts on a grand scale, like this is how we deal with problems on a region, you know, 
like what's the appropriate size for a city? How far should it be from another city? How many towns should be in between? Um, all the way down, recursively down to like, where do you put the lights in your kitchen? What do you hang on your walls? Um, so I find a lot of similarities uh, when I'm doing layout design, that recursive nature of things. Um, in 1994, uh, this is probably where most people have heard about design patterns. This theory was applied to um, computer science by uh, four developers in Silicon Valley, um, all about how to design software using uh, object-oriented programming. Uh, again, it was applied to um, user interfaces. There's a, a pretty cool site. Unfortunately, it's it's pretty outdated now. Um, uh, UIPatterns.com, I believe. I don't think it's .org. But it, it describes these uh, problems as they relate to user interfaces. You know, um, like if you have a breadcrumb, what problem are you solving with the breadcrumb? You know, it doesn't matter what it looks like or anything. It's, it's about the purpose of it and the problem that it's solving. Um, Luke Rabluski wrote a blog post about multi-device layout patterns, which is layout as it applies to, you know, your tablet, your phone, how it breaks down in different screen sizes. Um, Brad Frost wrote about it, um, responsive navigation patterns. These are patterns specific to, um, you know, how do you deal with complex navigations on a small screen um, and, like, what the different options are. Uh, if you haven't read either of those, definitely go check them out. But today we're, we're going to talk about just layout in general and some of the more fundamental concepts, I think, of uh, CSS and how we can solve these problems. So what is a layout? Um, a layout provides a structure to your screen. Um, essentially what it is is a bunch of containers that you put things in. I imagine a lot of you were probably in John Alvin's session before this. He's talking about components. Layouts are where you put your components. Um, again, layouts are recursive. You have layouts within layouts. Um, you know, here we have the overall page structure of a layout. Inside that, you probably have a node. If your node's complex, it has layout. It might have its own sidebar, header, image off to the side, whatever. Um, but it's all defined by the markup of the page. So the order of your markup is super important. Uh, what elements are next to each other is important. And we kind of manipulate it with CSS. Uh, these, out of like all the CSS properties, um, there are, these are the main ones that deal with layout itself. So when you're creating your layouts in CSS, um, I, know I find it, um, easy to organize things if I keep these properties kind of bundled together and not intermixed with um, like your typography, your font colors, your background colors, or border colors. I keep border width in here because that does affect layout, but your border style and uh, border color don't. So let's let's look at some actual patterns. Um, I'm going to start off super simple, and one that I call constrained elements. And again, these patterns, like, I would love to actually, if anyone's interested in this stuff, uh, sit and talk and collaborate on some of this stuff and actually document it. But everything you'll see here is just stuff that I've found in my day-to-day -day working, and stuff that I'm doing over and over again, so I'd love to chat about it afterwards. But so constrained elements. Give an element a defined width to prevent it from expanding too wide. Yeah, it's super simple. It's, it's one property. It's max width or, or width or whatever. So here we have um, just super long uh, bit of text. The measure is a little bit too long for, for it to be easily readable. Simple solution, just add like a, um, a max width to it so it doesn't get too wide. Uh, so that's pretty straightforward. Uh, here's another example of the same problem. Uh, this is a site that 
Ken Woodworth, our VP of design, just did for um, Create Upstate, which was a, a design conference up in Syracuse, New York. And using the same, the same constrained pattern, we typically use a, a class, like it's the L with a dash dash is a, a naming convention we use, kind of came from SMACS. Um, but this class is applied to each of these like horizontal regions to keep all that content from spilling out and bleeding all the way to the edge of the page. So if we wrap it in, you know, some, some outer div or whatever, we can apply like background or color to let it spill out. But our content is constrained in the middle. So this is something we use all over the place actually. Um, so this leads us to our next pattern, which is rows of relevant content. Um, divide the screen into rows of relevant content such that the hierarchy and content relationships are preserved across different screen sizes. Um, back to that same example, uh, we've divided the page up into um, horizontal rows so that when you do shrink it down on a mobile site, that all your content in that row that's relevant to each other, you know, the time is relevant to the location, and um, all that kind of maintains its relationship down into like more of a linear format on a mobile phone. Um, using this same concept on, this is, uh, again, the Colorado Public Radio site. Um, one thing, you know, if you look on the right-hand side, it looks like there's just one long sidebar down the side and then one long piece of main content. Um, what we realized is that uh, if that were one sidebar and we just did the simple wrap that around to the bottom, all of a sudden on the mobile phone, the ad was at the bottom of the page and sponsors don't want to buy ads that are at the bottom of the page. So what we ended up doing is splitting that up into horizontal rows so that um, you know, the ad could wrap right underneath uh, the main featured image. We get the on-air block up there, which is important to a lot of people. And that kind of hierarchy of the page, the important stuff is at the top, is maintained. Um, this next one, layout modifiers, has a lot to do with uh, naming conventions. So following a naming convention for, class, for classes intended to modify layout. So what does that mean? Um, here's a simple layout. It's uh, one container, and we have just three divs in it, um, primary, secondary, and tertiary. And depending on what class we apply to that outer wrapper, it's going to adjust the whole layout. Um, so you can see we can do three columns change the class, and we can do the sidebars after. We can flip it over, put the sidebars before, all just with changing this one class, or, or do a triptych with the main content in the middle and then each of the, the tertiary and secondary content <coughs> to either side. Um, so that L dash dash naming convention, um, that's something we use a lot on like very generic layouts uh, that we can reuse uh, like throughout the site. Um, I find like generic layout doesn't always apply to, to every context. So sometimes we have, you know, an article node or an event or a project or whatever um, that has kind of its own regions in it. So apply the same general solution using a slightly different naming convention in which we use the whatever the component is. So in this case, it's article component uh, with the teaser, and you style the each of the regions underneath that. And you probably notice that I'm using the direct child selector. Uh, that's very intentional. Because like I said, layouts are recursive. If you have something like, uh, say, a sidebar, and you're using that throughout your page, you probably have a lot of different sidebars. You don't want styles from like a macro layout, a large layout, bleeding down into those micro layouts. Uh, 
so this specificity is very intentional in that it, um, it actually keeps styles from bleeding into other styles. Um, so another one that I use quite often called uh, the gutter pull, and that's position an element by pulling it into the gutter established by its parent container. So here's an example of another article. Um, just have a bunch of paragraphs with the block quote in it, and if we want to pull that that block quote out off to the side to emphasize it or whatever, um, first give it a defined width so it's not just filling the whole area, uh, float it to the left, and then add some negative left margin to pull it off into the side. And you notice that when you float something, all that text kind of collapses out of it, takes it out of the flow, and um, just pulls it along with it. So we can use that to our advantage on, say, like an article layout or something. Uh, this is this is like a you know a teaser for a book, and this is what you'd see you know on the mobile on your mobile device where um, you don't want the text squishing around the image of the book or whatever. So if we want to apply that same principle to this. Um, First, we'll add some padding to the, the outer container itself to kind of create this gutter. Then we'll float the um, image off to the left to give it a width, and then pull that off into the side, and then you've created this, this gutter. All of the, um, the content is now going to left align, even if it, um, because we're pulling it into that gutter and we've set padding on the container, that now any of the elements, say there's, our summary gets super long, that's not going to wrap underneath our cover. It's just going to continue down and align nicely. Um, so that, that gets used a lot. You can do, um, say, if, if like your markup, if you wanted the title to come before the image and the image, so the image was in the middle, but on a large, larger screen like this, you still want it to the side. You could actually, after you pull that out, in fact, you don't even need to pull it out, but you could absolutely position it. You just need to make sure that you set like a min, a min height on um, your content based on how big your image is going to be. Um, so that's gutter pull. Another way we can um, exploit the margins. I guess one thing I did want to point, or did want to point out, is that. Um, an advantage to this, you can do it completely fluid, um, but one advantage to doing it this way is that you can have a fixed width gutter, and the rest can be fluid. So your image is on the side. It's not going to get awkwardly large or small, but you can still expand and contract that. Um, so margin overflow, allow an element to overflow its container by applying negative margins to both the left and right sides. So this is um, just a, an example block that you might have on your site. We have a block title, uh, the big red thing. If we apply negative margins to the outside of that, that'll actually grow the width of the element. Um, so we can kind of exploit that and create this kind of wrapping around effect. Um, that you see here. Another place that this is useful, um, say we have three columns of text. I don't know, I hope you guys can see those guides on the outer, the outer sides. Um, so we have these three elements. All of them have a width. All of them have padding. They're all floated, um, just set to like 33% um, of the width to create three columns. If we add the negative margins to each side, that'll pull them out and kind of compensate for those, those outer, um, that outer padding. Um, an advantage to this, you don't have to, there's a little bit more uh, cross-browser support because you don't have to do like int child or anything like that, um, or like first child, last child. First child is pretty well supported, but last child is not supported in IE8. Um, 
so it, it kind of compensates for, for that. Uh, another interesting one is uh, intrinsic ratios. So this one's kind of hard to explain, but when the aspect ratio of an element is known, but the target size is not, use padding and absolute positioning to preserve the aspect ratio of an element. So this is better explained with an example. So we have a YouTube video here. Um, YouTube videos, when you embed them, typically iframes. Uh, when a browser interprets an iframe, it doesn't necessarily know the aspect ratio of it. Whereas, like, if you, if you add an image to a browser, um, the browser knows based on the file, like, what the height and width is. And it can figure out how to properly scale things if you do, like, max width or whatever. Uh, not so much with an, with an iframe. So what happens if... Um, the column that our, our video is in gets shrunk down. Um, our video luckily doesn't like uh, squeeze or scale awkwardly, but it does crop off the edges. So we can fix that by exploiting the fact that um, if you set top or bottom padding as a percentage, it's actually a percentage of the width of the element, not the height. So Knowing that most YouTube videos are, I think the ratio is somewhere around like 65.25% um, height to width. We can add that 65.25% to the top of the container and then absolutely position the video itself and set the height to 100% height and 100% width, um, which collapses the actual height of the element because it's absolutely positioned. There's nothing there to um, create any, uh, I guess, content area, but our padding's still there. So, went the wrong way. So now we can adjust that um, to fit wherever. So, grid systems are kind of a large pattern in themselves. Uh, essentially, we divide the screen into a series of vertical columns to facilitate the organization and alignment of components. Um, just to give an example, this is the uh, Indianapolis Museum of uh, Modern Arts, a 12-column grid. You can see how things are aligning to it. Um, I'm not going to get into just why grids are awesome in themselves. I think uh, there's plenty of that out there. Uh, if you want to read about it, Ordering Disorder by Koi Van and Practical Guide to Designing for the Web by Mark Bolton are both great. Uh, definitely check those out. What I am more interested in are those underlying patterns to actually implementing grids. Um, so there's a basic one, the gutter grid. For each grid unit in the grid system, include a gutter to help space content. I'm sure you all are very familiar with this, um, both this site and this pattern. So we have a gutter, a bunch of columns. Or I'm sorry, we have a, a grid with a bunch of columns and gutters in between. Um, it just helps us space the content so our text doesn't run into each other. Uh, one thing that we've been doing more often lately, and I, I don't see a whole lot of, but is the gutterless grid. Um, so exclude the gutters from the grid unit. Instead, use empty columns as gutters. Um, we've been using this on most of our projects lately. Um, it Typically, it requires more columns. Uh, like a lot of grids are, you know, 12 or 16 columns. Our gutterless grids are... You know, we started with 24. We're actually using 23 uh, column grids, and if anyone wants to know why, I can explain that. Um, but essentially, more columns, smaller space, and that helps kind of with the sizing of, of gutters. As a front-end developer, I find those much easier to work with than having to deal with those, like we saw earlier, the, the intricacies of um, outer paddings. Um, 
I don't know what our designers think about it. Ken can answer that. Um, so symmetric grid. Construct a grid from equal width grid units. And same example, same, equal, equal grid units. Um, we have 24 columns here. They're all the same width. Um, again, this other example, this is how most grids, grids are. Uh, the asymmetric grid. So construct a grid from varied, uh, varied width grid units designed specifically for the content. Um, this one, I think to implement a whole grid system has been uh, challenging in the past, but now with SAS and grid frameworks, um, this is way more plausible to actually implement. Uh, to give an example of this, this is from uh, Mark Bolton's unfortunately not forthcoming book. I think it's a book he had been working on for a while and just announced that he's not actually going to finish it, um, which is a bit sad, but understandable. Um, so you see here that we, we don't have equal columns. There's actually, it's like a four column grid on top of a, I think five or three column grid. I'm not sure. Um, but anyways, the the idea here is that the grid itself is designed specifically for the content. You know, the, the equal column grid, the 12 columns, and the 16 column grid, I think those were born more out of necessity and ease of implementation um, than anything, whereas I think an ideal is actually designing your grid around the content. Like, do you have an ad on your site that needs to be, you know, 310 pixels or whatever ads have to be? Um, so design your grid around that element and everything else is a ratio of that kind of fixed point. Um, so that's something we actually haven't implemented anything in that yet, but um, I definitely want to. And I think hopefully I've lit a fire under the, the designers to actually go out and explore some of these other um, grids. Um, so another pattern with uh, grid systems is the class-based grid system. So align elements to the grid by applying a system of predefined classes to markup. Um, you probably recognize this from 960 GS or Bootstrap or Foundation. And the idea here is that your grid system is kind of contained in all these um, predefined classes that you apply to your markup to get the desired results. So this example from Foundation, we have, um, uh, I think it's, uh, I can't read, like large dash 10 columns, large dash 8 columns. Um, and so on and so forth. This is good for quick prototyping. It's very handy for that because you kind of have this grid structure that you can already work with and you just start slapping classes everywhere. Um, slapping classes everywhere implies that you actually have good solid control over the markup and I'm sure a lot of us in here know that's not always the case with Drupal. Um, so it can be tricky in some cases to implement with Drupal um, consistently. Uh, there used to be issues with, um, I guess, the semanticness in, in these classes in that um, you would have classes like, I think uh, Bootstrap used to use span, so like span 8 or span 4 that kind of applied to the desktop version of the sites. And then when you shrunk that down, you know, what does span 8 mean on a mobile device? Like, do you still have 12 columns? Um, is it an 8-column grid? Like, what does that mean now? Uh, so there, I think both Bootstrap and Foundation have implemented this idea of, like, different systems of classes for the different grids so that, you know, if you have small um, you get these classes prefixed with small meant like this applies to whatever your mobile breakpoint is. Um, again, this stuff's good for for prototyping. Um, the alternative is a, a semantic grid system. So align elements to the 
grid by applying layout properties to selectors using a grid framework. Um, so the difference here is here we're applying the, um, the properties directly to whatever selector we want um, before we're taking these predefined classes and applying them to whatever markup we had. Um, this is, I find this much more flexible. You only get the, the styles that you actually need because you're applying them where you need them. Uh, so it's, it's more efficient in that respect. And it also opens up like the underlying math to the grid. So say if we're, we're adding this mix in to something like, okay, span eight columns starting at the first column, um, that's going to set like the appropriate width and margin on things. But a lot of these frameworks provide that underlying math so you can apply those widths like, you know, four columns of a 12-column grid is 33%. You could apply that to, you know, text indenting or padding or margin, whatever we want. Uh, it doesn't have to be um, just like margin and width. Uh, so these are just examples. This is, all three of these are different frameworks. There's Singularity, uh, which is co-maintained by Sam Richards. I'm sure a lot of you know from here, Snugug. Uh, Suzy is another alternative. Uh, and Zengrids, which is uh, John Alvin's project. Um, I'm not gonna get into like which one's better or whatever. I think they're all great. If someone wants to know what I think this week, I'll, we can talk later. Um, but essentially all these, it's just different syntax. They do the same thing. Um, and each has its own, own features. Um, so one of those features is uh, f like a float layout. So this is kind of what we already looked at before where you just you're floating, um, floating elements like one after another. So create a column or create columns by floating a series of elements with pre or defined widths. So just an example of that. Again, we have three elements. Um, give them each a width of 33%. Float them left, and then you have your columns. Um, and you can add padding within those. Um, that works in a lot of cases. It works really well. Use it all the time. Um, that is what... SUSE used to be built on, Singularity used to be built on it, and then added the option for the next pattern, which is isolation. So it's very similar, but given a series of floated elements, give each a negative trailing margin in order to reset the orientation of the following element. So again, this is another one that's hard to explain in words, better with an example. So this is what we, we had before. Now we have each of these elements, 33% wide, all floated. Um, if we add you know, left margin to, say, the secondary, it's going to push everything to the right. Um, isolation gets over that, that fact by adding negative margin to each element so that it pulls the uh, following element back to... I guess you'd call it the origin. So now we have three elements. They're all, you know, four columns, four columns wide. They're all stacked on top of each other. But now they have a consistent kind of base starting point. So if we add left margin to any of them, it's going to push them over. So now we've isolated that primary element from the rest of them so that it can freely move back and forth um, without affecting the position of others. This is what allows you to do a lot of um, like column rearranging and whatnot. So we can do quite a few different things. Some of these grid systems offer the ability to define the direction in which these are floated, which is good for just like right to left language um, implementations, but it's also good for just kind of giving you a little bit extra power on manipulate, 
manipulating the markup um, or the CSS. So here what we're doing is we have, um, say the primary element is eight columns wide. Uh, secondary element is, I don't know, four. But the secondary element is floated to the right, and the primary element is floated to the left. So the tertiary element can just clear the left column, and therefore it's actually, it's just clearing the primary element, but it's going to wrap around uh, the secondary. So it allows the secondary to actually kind of run past the tertiary element. Um, and that that actually comes in handy in a lot of places. Uh, it's how we were able to do on that CPR site, like get those that on-air block to kind of wrap around some of the new stuff. Um, so that that kind of sums up some of the, some of the basic design patterns. Um, I've got more, but wanted to get into some actual Drupal specific stuff. And how do you actually, like, where do you apply this layout stuff to Drupal? Um, I think there's kind of two main patterns with Drupal. Um, one is simply template files. There's, these will probably be the main template files that you're actually dealing with um, layout in terms of, like, actual core Drupal. Um, Views could probably be included in here, but views is like in itself, you know, one view is like six different templates. So um, it's kind of a crapshoot as to where you would actually mess with layout in a view. Um, so yeah, the page template. In the page template, you'd probably be applying layout to your actual regions. So your regions have a bunch of blocks in them. So like some of these classes that we were looking at earlier, we'd apply those to uh, regions themselves. Nodes, um, like core nodes, don't have the concept of regions. So you'll just be kind of creating regions in a template just by defining markup and manually sticking in whatever field you want in there. And user profile is essentially the same thing as a node. Um, so one thing to help manage this, I don't know if anyone here does, um, just out of curiosity, how many people like edit a lot of templates when they're theming a Drupal site? Uh, not too many. What do you guys do instead? You display suite? Panels. Panels. Cool. Okay. Um, we actually we used to use a lot of display suite. Um, but we've gone back to doing node templates, and I think the secret sauce in that is theme hook suggestions, which, again, I don't want to get too deep into this, but I just want to point it out. If you don't know what theme hook suggestions are, find them, figure them out, and use them. They're great. But essentially, it allows you to add, create whatever reusable template you want. So a lot of people get away from, like, editing node templates because it's like, oh, uh, doing the same thing to every template and you just redo everything. But like theme hook suggestions will allow you to say, like, I want nodes from this content type and this content type and ones on this page to use this layout. Um, so good, a lot of you have used panels. Um, like I mentioned, display suite. I think the other alternative um, to this kind of basic template approach is using CTools layouts. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, panels just because of the, the layout model. Um, I think the big, the big difference here, like so comparing a panels layout to like creating layouts in a page template, is it like I'm sorry. So in a page template, you have a bunch of regions. Those regions are defined by your theme. So you have one theme, and you have however many layouts. That's not going to change from page to page. You know, you can just not put some regions in there. But it gets kind of weird to maintain when you have a, just a ton of regions named whatever. 
and you're kind of using them in different places and different layouts. Uh, what I like about CTOOLS layouts is you actually define what regions you want per template. So you have a layout and say I have a, um, like a sidebar layout. You say, okay, in this template I have sidebar region and I have a content region and then you can put whatever in that. Um, these layouts can be used, so they can be used in panels, and panels is great because you can put whatever the hell you want in a panel. You know, it doesn't have to be a block. It could be a view. It could be a node. It could be individual fields. Uh, display suite, it's a little less flexible. I mean, you could put anything that's an entity, um, but Essentially, you're just dealing with fields, and you can get blocks in there by making a block a field or making a view a field, uh, which to me started feeling a little dirty. Um, Omega 4X, personally, I haven't used it, but from what I understand, it uses um, C tool layouts. I'm sure there's people in here that use it and can uh, validate that claim. Uh, so, actually, creating your own layouts, uh, super easy. For basic files needed. You have your include file, which defines your regions um, and just points to other files. You have um, your, your thumbnail, your PNG, what the layout looks out like, the CSS that it's applied to it, and the template. So we'll look at those real quick. Uh, sidebar after, again, like I was just saying, this has um, two regions, uh, content and sidebar. Uh, I got a little careless with my naming there, so main and content are the same thing. Um, so this defines the title, like the user-friendly uh, name of your layout, category that it's in, and the interface. Um, the icon is the thumbnail. The theme is actually the theme hook, so whatever this is is going to be the, the name of your, or the prefix of your uh, template file. So in this case, sidebar underscore after our template file is going to be sidebar dash after dot tpl dot php. Uh, what CSS it uses, you can actually use different CSS for um, admin screens, which is handy. Um, and then the actual regions. So again, you just whatever regions you need in your template, you can define them, and they don't have to be the same as anything else. Um, so here's just the thumbnail, pretty straightforward. Uh, I apologize for the crappy syntax highlighting. For some reason, Highlight.js thinks that um, these PHP tags within HTML are HTML comments. So, um, But I'm sure you guys all know what a template looks like, and it doesn't exactly <laughs> look like that. Um, and then you have your, your CSS. And this is super basic. I mean, usually the CSS is a little bit more complicated than that, but for illustration pur purposes. So I like the fact that you can use these templates in different places. It provides a consistent interface. Um, it's consistent from a front-end perspective. You can reuse these layouts across different sites. Um, it's pretty good. Um, so I guess... In closing, I'd just like to say that uh, design patterns can be applied to multiple con contexts, like we just saw. Um, the idea with the design pattern is that it's super general and it can can apply to different things. Um, and design patterns are not actually designed. Design patterns are observed, so you don't go out there and figure out like oh, I'm going to create a pattern. You like as you're working, and you find yourself doing the same thing over and over. Like, eh, really, I'm just floating columns. You know, the width is changing, the spacing's changing, but it's the same thing. And that can kind of help you create. Like, you know, if you're using SAS, it can help you kind of create your mix-ins and find out how to like actually rearrange your code and whatnot. But um, yeah, I encourage you to just as you're working, you know, and you notice these things, write them down. Keep a notebook. Um, document them somewhere. Like I said, I'm interested in collaborating with anyone that's interested in, you know, writing these down and getting, like, 
just some community feedback and actually testing to see if, you know, is this a good pattern? Does it really apply? So that that's it. Um, if you don't mind, go to the go to the site and fill in the survey. This is the first time I've given this talk, so I'd like to know if it's interesting or useful to any of you. Right, that's it. Any questions? I think there's there were there were a number of places where you um, you showed something and you might have like the HTML or something, but you didn't have the CSS shown on the slide. Yes. Um, is there a way to get a hold of the CSS that you used in each of the yes. examples? There actually is no CSS. It's all, it's all a lie. Uh, yeah. so, um, no, I actually I already, these slides are all up on uh, GitHub. And if you go to um, the, the same URL, there's a link to it, and you can see it in there. I apologize for uh, it not being very clean and organized. Um, you mentioned with the gutterless grid, you're using a 23-column grid. You kind of, oh, yeah. So you want to know about the 23-column uh, grid? Yeah. Cool. So since you're using gutters, as, or sorry, your columns as a gutters, uh, if you have a 23-column grid, um, so two, two columns or like two 11-unit columns, you'd have one left over for the gutter in the middle, which is 23. So you'd have, you know, three columns would be seven units each four columns, um, five units. So it actually worked out nice. But when, uh, yeah, when our designer said it, it's a 23-column grid, I'm like, what the, what the fuck are you thinking? <laughs> it doesn't seem never work. Cool. <laughs> so, but it works. At the end, you gave the example of the sidebar after .inc and the .tpl files. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't clear. How do you get to use actually that? So you write that .inc file. What's the next step? Okay. Well, it kind of depends on where you're using it. You can either define your layouts in the theme or in a module. Uh, syntax is pretty much the same. But if you're defining them in your, your theme, uh, you just create a layouts folder. And each layout will have its own folder. So you'd have a folder called sidebar after. And then in your .info file in the theme, um, I don't know what the syntax is offhand, but I think it's like plugins, layout, something. Just like you were adding a CSS file or a JavaScript file. Very similar. I find that the easiest, easiest way to do it. In your, uh, in your slides, you talked about class naming conventions based on the, the like the specifics of the layout versus mm -hmm. class names specific to the content and view modes. Um, and yeah. I think both both require different ways of implementing them. So I guess which one do you have the most, or have you had the most traction with and kind of prefer to use, or is it kind of like a hybrid of both? Uh, it's pretty much a hybrid. Like anytime I'm doing layout on like a node or a content type, I'll use that like article dash dash whatever. And if it's, say, the node, like if that layout applies to multiple content types, I'll come up with like a generic name other than article. I don't know, you can't get much gen more generic than article. But, um, and then for the L dash, those, those get used throughout the site, more on the page level and like the larger level stuff. But, I use it for sidebars and whatnot. So I guess more specifically, if you want to use the same or the same or similar layouts across multiple content types, do you just chain selectors together, or do you try to force the classes you want up that apply to that layout? Um, I kind of make that decision at the time. Like, don't have a good solid rule for it, but okay. I typically err on the side of like a component, like thinking that. You know, yes, technically this could be used on another part of the site, but I'd also like this particular component to be component to be completely independent of everything else. So 
I'm fine with a little duplication there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you said uh, responsive video. I, I, I think you said you were making the top and the bottom padding a percentage of the width. Is that right? Yeah, so it's just a, you would do one or the other. It doesn't matter which one. But uh, So you would say top padding is like whatever the aspect ratio of whatever you're trying to uh, Whatever the aspect maintain. ratio of the video is? Yes, so of like your iframe. So for an example, like, if it's a like sixteen by nine or something like that, mm -hmm. like like what would your top padding be? Um, oops. I can't read that up there, but it would be that point. 56. Yeah, fifty six point two five. Okay. So you just divide the. Um, the height by the width. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, you were talking about the, the isolation mm -hmm. um, method. Um, is there somewhere I could read more about that? I'm not sure I'm fully comprehending um, how to implement that. Or Yes, that's, um, <clears throat> have you ever used Zen, the theme? Okay, um, that was actually uh, credit John Albin with that. Uh, let's see. I can't see what I'm typing, so. It's probably not something you want to type in on a live demo. But. Yeah. So responsive designs, dirty little secret, I think has a good explanation of how that works. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, thank you all very much.